Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss business-centric data modeling, sponsored today by Couchbase and Irwin by Quest. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panel, so you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Tim for a brief word from our first sponsor, Couchbase. Tim, hello and welcome. Great. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, thanks, everyone, um, for joining us today. Just got a few slides I'm going to take you through real quick. Um, talking about Couchbase and how our, our database supports uh, business-centric uh, data modeling. So let's let's get right to it. Um, and as I begin, just very high level, I want to talk about the fact that you know over the past few decades, uh, database requirements have have changed a lot, right? I mean, historically, databases and data modeling were really uh, first built around things that were very operational tasks. If you think about order taking or financial transactions or ERP systems. That's, that's what, you know, the, the bread and butter of relational databases, right? Um, and then over time, there was the addition of the move to data analytics, right? Understanding customers, understanding behaviors, understanding the patterns of what happened. Um, and today, the need for databases and data modeling has expanded to kind of another uh, more common use case as well, which is kind of the interactions and the experiences we have with customers and partners and employees, right? If you think about the web pages and mobile apps we use, they're all driven by data that needs to be stored uh, in a database and modeled uh, for those interactions, right? Um, dynamic catalogs, personalized experience, experience, and so forth. And uh, that requires greater flexibility of the data model in the database, um, but that gives customers, uh, uh, sorry, companies competitive uh, edge when they're building these experiences and applications, right? Um, and the data has changed due to the number of data, uh, the, the way the data is accessed, the, the way that we develop applications and so on, but we still use uh, a lot of core legacy uh components that that are still super valuable to databases right so how do you how do you build that um and and what's the best way to do that right it's, it's you know if you can model the database to the application um and and have that flexibility that allows you to to build a, a better application so what is couchbase as a database well we are a no sql a database and we store data as json documents and as opposed to relational tables uh, that that you might be more familiar with, um, and what that means is 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 in building applications you have more flexibility in, in the design um, and how data is presented, but it's great for things like user profiles, personalized catalogs, and things like that, um, and it's partially due to the way that we store data, uh, often denormalizing the data from what you might think of if you think of like a user profile. In a relational database, you might be splitting out that profile or information about a customer into many, many different tables. Uh, in, a, in Couchbase, what you do is you'd store all that related information within a document, right? This makes it easier to uh, get at that information quickly because you're not doing a lot of joins across tables, but it also allows you for more flexibility in changing that document um, over time and evolving your application and involving that experience with the customer. Um, but how does this relate to relational? Well, Couchbase, in addition to uh, JSON documents, has a very dynamic, logical uh, containment model. So, uh, which is, when we say dynamic, it, it's optional, right? So data can just be stored within the database, which we call uh, a bucket uh, as documents, but we can also add in, those documents can be organized in scopes and collections within the document, which can be aligned to a relational schema uh, in a relational world. So for um, parts of, a, uh, of an application or parts of a use case that needs more structure, Couchbase can support that. If there needs to be more flexibility, 
uh, we can we can model that um, as well. And so, what makes Couchbase uh, different? Um, well, it's really the fact that we we have a lot of different uh, capabilities within our database platform. So, Couchbase began uh, over a decade ago with the merger of two technologies and integrating uh, an integrated cache technology and a JSON document data store, um, and have over time added key capabilities like. Uh, SQL query. So we use query, uh, SQL as our query language, Re relational capabilities, some I just highlighted, but also a cost-based optimizer um, and, and other key components. And then other services like full text search. So for example, Louis Vuitton uses our full text search capability in uh, their application that their employees use in their store. So they're trying to drive a great experience with customers. Uh, they can use their mobile apps in store, search for products, looking at by photos, finding it in other stores, helping improve that experience with customers. Uh, operational analytics, Domino's, for example, uses our, our analytics uh, to drive better promotions with their customers. They don't take the data out and put it in a data warehouse. They have real-time access to the data. Things like eventing, uh, these essentially data uh, change capture and triggering events off of those changes in the data. Carnival Cruise Line, for example, uses this uh, to, to drive better customer experience. So if you're on a Carnival Cruise and you're in your room and you order a sandwich and you decide to walk down to the pool, uh, Carnival has a, an app and it knows that you've made that move and it, your sandwich will arrive to you at the pool. Uh, and then in terms of things like mobile database, United Airlines uh, uses Couchbase for their crew scheduling. So the crew can have um, wherever they are, very easy access to their schedule. They can you know, trade shifts with employees and see, see what they're doing. All of these different applications I highlight give these companies a competitive edge and, the, and a lot of flexibility in how they interact with their employees and customers. Um, so, all of this combined is what uh, kind of separates uh, Couchbase from, from other vendors. It's at, at its core, uh, it's the flexibility, which is the JSON document structure that I highlighted, and multimodal services. All of these services combined give, give the platform a lot of great uh, uh, flexibility. Um, and the familiarity of SQL as a query language, the dynamic structures where for, for those who are coming from a relational world, uh, work well in Couchbase, supporting asset transactions, and our, our patented cost-based optimizer for, for JSON documents. So all of these things are key to uh, Couchbase as a standout database. And, and in the end, what this means for customers is to allow them to innovate faster, build uh, applications that meet the business needs that they're trying to achieve with less time. So thank you for that. Thank you for allowing me to give that quick uh, introduction to Couchbase and uh, back to you, Shannon. Thank you, Tim, for kicking us off. If you have questions for Tim or about Couchbase, you may submit your questions in the Q&A as he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end. And now let me turn it over to Andy for a brief word from our second sponsor, Erwin by Quest. Andy, hello and welcome. And there's my mute button. Good Perfect. afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Shannon. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be working with Donna and Dataversity again. Um, I'm going to give you a quick run through of what um, Erwin Data Modeler brings to the to the table as 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 Donna is going to show you. We're going to be focusing on or she's going to be focusing on business centric data modeling and um, this is definitely something that I show all the time. Um, this is a conceptual model. And then we have our logical models. And Donna's going to walk you through the business um, benefits of working with that. But I do want to point out that um, Irwin Data Modeler, as you may know, has been around for quite some time. And over the, um, uh, the past few years, actually in the past three years, we have made a, um, a major um, shift to being able to support all of the popular data structures that are out there today. So it's not just um, your relational databases, uh, but we can also work with NoSQL databases um, along with um, and specifically around Couchbase too. So uh, I just came back from a road trip with um, Couchbase talking about how Erwin Data Modeler can be used to um, to denormalize your relational structures into Couchbase buckets. Uh, full native support basically means that we can reverse engineer, we can forward engineer, and we can compare 
our physical um, structures to the physical structures as they're implemented on the disk. Um, we can do those changes. We can build objects from, from scratch um, for all of these platforms, from Amazon Key Spaces all the way down to Teradata and many points in between. So Mongo, JSON, uh, Avro, Parquet, uh, Databricks, Couchbase, et cetera. Now, Erwin's approach to data modeling is to um, do a combined um, model without having to have a separate logical model and a separate physical model. And we can do that very quickly. I, I speak to lots of customers all the time and they need um, the ability to um, document what is out in their data landscape. But you know, when we hand something like this over to the end users, um, it probably introduces way more questions than we're willing to answer. Um, you know, what are these FKs? Why is that red? How, what is, what are these abbreviations mean? So we can take the data modeler and point it at your physical structures and then start building out your, um, your, your logical and your business, business centric models all at the same time. So this is coming from the same database. And what we've done is we've actually translated the abbreviations in SQL um, into the business terms. So we found a table called cust, and then we create an entity called customer, and then all the attributes follow through that naming process. Now, this is obviously simpler than a schema diagram, um, but again, it could introduce more questions. So we can distill that down a little bit further into an entity definition um, diagram. And this is definitely getting more towards the conceptual side of the house here. As you can see, this is just showing the entities along with their relationship and the business terms, including the definition of these entities. So it, when you're having a discussion about your data structures, this is very, very simple to understand what each one of these components means. And then finally, we could break it down even further or distill it even further into a conceptual model where we're literally just showing the entities and how they're related. And all of this can be done by pointing at your physical structures, creating a logical physical model, and then using the diagrams to space everything out and, and to use this information to share with the business users. And it's all tied to reality as much as we can get it to there. And then one last final thing, um, and I'm really looking forward to work to seeing Donna's presentation um, with Couchbase. Um, I just spent a, a few weeks on the road um, with Couchbase in, in various cities and my partners and teams were over in Europe and uh, the Middle East. Um, and we were talking about how we can use Erwin Data Modeler to uh, convert into Couchbase format. So what we're looking at here is the actual documents that can be created by um, just denormalizing your relational models and then working with them in uh, the couch based format, your unstructured format here. And as we look over here, you'll see that we do have all of the specific couch based components, um, most particularly um, with scopes. This is very important in this in the current leases couch base, so we can work with all of those. So that's what Erwin can do. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I appreciate your time. I'm looking forward to Donna's presentation and uh, back to you, Shannon. Thank you, Andy, for this. And if you have any questions for Andy or about Erwin by Quest, you may submit your questions in the Q&A as he'll likewise be joining us in the Q&A portion. Uh, thank you to both Couchbase and Erwin by Quest for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. Now, let me introduce the speaker for this series, Donna Burbank. Donna has is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon, and, and nice to see uh, some familiar faces in the audience from all over the globe. It was nice to see people kind of chime in on that. Uh, so welcome, and thanks to the sponsors as well. So um, sponsors gave a great overview of kind of some data modeling solutions and some technical solutions. Today, we're going to kind of bring it up a level um, and talk really about business-centric data modeling. Um, to give my little pitch for this series, if you have, this is the first time you've joined us, um, <clears throat> you'll see that there's been a 
a wide range of topics throughout the year. Uh, Dataversity is great about keeping all of those in their archive. So if there's anything um, in the past about BI or data governance uh, that might be of interest to you, that is all available. Um, and there's some cool stuff coming up this year and hopefully next year, um, you'll, that'll be published soon. Um, not hopefully next year, definitely next year. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to make you nervous, Shannon. Um, but this year we'll talk about graph databases, EA, um, data architecture. I think a lot of what we'll be talking about today really will tie into that December webinar um, because I do think at the business level, tying in these high level business data models to something like a wider enterprise architecture and process models and um, component models and user journeys and, and a lot of that stuff um, can be really helpful. But um, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Today, uh, we're talking about business centric data models. And I'm going to keep stressing that um, it is super powerful to be able to take uh, one of these business data models and turn it into the tech that the guys talked about in the beginning. We're going to not talk about that today so much um, because I think there's value. And I don't want to say it's a, it's a lost art because we do this all the time. It's a specialized art um, in really creating these visual models to get the business rules. Um, and, and they can be super successful and they have their place. So their place is, is really that second bullet, which is that visual way to communicate data-centric business rules um, with the business that can be then translated to the tech, um, which is a really powerful tool. Though because they're so visual, um, and I love some of the demos in the beginning of, of the data modeling tool, you can kind of see different ways to show it for different audiences. Um, so we'll go through that. I can pro provide some um, practical, uh, hopefully some concrete examples. We'll, we'll show a few case studies um, and hopefully um, give you some good background around data centric modeling so we need to start with a cartoon uh so one of the books in, a, in my profile earlier was data modeling for the business which is just on this topic um and we have cartoons and when you have data model cartoons you have to show them because who has those right um, but i did want to start here um i don't i well uh, we may be i may be biased because at, at our company we always start with the data model um, and they're generally very very well um accepted i do uh sometimes hear of folks saying, I, I want to skip that, or, you know, we don't have time to build a model, let's just jump to the coding, or we're agile, we don't need a model. Um, you know, I feel like my mother is sitting on my shoulder saying, you know, if you don't have time to do it right, you have time to do it again. Um, and, and yes, you may build a solution um, faster, uh, but will the, those business rules be right? And, and, and kind of the joke there maybe it's not funny at all but it might not be funny unless you've experienced it you know we're almost done with user acceptance testing and everything looks great we're building this new marketing application just one small question um what's a customer and and i did not get this joke I, i've been going to day diversity and dama conferences gosh for probably 20 years now um and i remember that someone told that joke early on and i and i was young and i said yeah how hard is that a customer is a customer right oh how naive i was anyone who's doing master data management or you know single view of customer it, is it a you know is it a wholesale customer is it a retail customer is it a last customer is it a, you know there's so many different aspects of that and and um you really need to get to the nut of that or none of your applications got to be right and i have worked for and with multinational companies that will rename nameless who have made embarrassing costly and sometimes um you know legal implications of mistakes on what is a customer um one that will definitely run out of named um sent uh, renewal notices to prospects uh they someone went to the customer database and sales uses that all the time you gotta talk to my customer you know we don't <laughs> hopefully <laughs> You, you lose friends when you talk to sales. You know, actually, it's not a customer; it's a prospect. You, know, you, should, you know, but it's, it's slang, right? We say a customer, um, but in that case, it, it, you would not send a renewal notice to someone who doesn't have the product, right? So hugely embarrassing. You had to, you know, undo a lot of things. But it was a, it was a reasonable mistake from someone on the database side that saw a database called customer. Um, but again, there's a lot of nuance around that. Um, also, in that terms of that that last saying, I, I want to touch back on that as well. If you don't have time to do it right, do you have time to do it again? There's often a misconception, I think, that that doing this business data modeling has to take a long time. You know, I, I've found, you know, we do a lot of kind of, I, I don't like to use the word agile, but, you know, rapid development, you know, we we always start with kind of pilots and 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 really get to the nut of some quick wins, really quickly and, and we're able to we always start with a conceptual model even if it's whiteboarding it in an afternoon or a few days and i've found that generally you get to 80 or 90 percent of that data model um really quickly and have some huge aha moments with the business of how things fit together um, i'll show some quotes later in the presentation of, of business people that have really been relieved to finally see a model of their business and how it 
understands. And I think, again, we do these in kind of workshops with whiteboards or virtual whiteboards in, in this day and age. Um, again, you might get 90% of the way in a few 90% of the way there in a few hours, and it might take you six months or a year to get the rest, right? Because <laughs> sometimes that's where you get those really difficult issues about customer business rules or product hierarchies or, you know, and those, all, but, but you can really focus in on those through the data model. Um, we often do kind of, you know, cartoony highlights of, you know, honing in on that problem area of this one, one cardinality rule is what's causing our problems, or this one hierarchy is what's causing our problems. So really a great way to really get to the nut of the issues um, and really just communicate. So don't, don't want to over hit this slide. <laughs> I think I just talked a long time about that one slide, but um, it really is super important to ha have this way to document these business centric um, data rules. Uh, there are levels of data models, um, and, and folks argue over levels or wh whatever, but there's there's some um, few industry standard ones. What we're not going to talk so much about today is the, are those physical models, whether it's a relational model or a key value pair or a JSON file or you know, important, um, but not important when we're up at the business level because they are business-centric data rules of, you know, does a, can a customer have more than one account? It doesn't matter if that's on COBOL or DB2 or Azure database, <laughs> customer can still only have one account, right? So um, that's where we are, that that kind of that dark blue conceptual model layer. You know, sometimes there's even a, a layer above, even these high level subject areas of customer of product, um, you know, especially in a larger organization, even to kind of subset it up there, you know, it, even, even just, you know, discussing what is an employee? Uh, what, what is a customer? What is a product? And again, if you're new to data modeling, so you might we might sound crazy um, until you really get into the nut of things. Each one of those examples, I've been working with customers this year that really find some you know uh, gnarly rules <laughs> around those. Uh, down at the logical level, that lighter blue, that's still a business centric model. Um, as Andy showed, though, that's where you get to a little level of detail. So at the conceptual level, you really are talking about terms and definitions. Um, I like the example that Andy showed. It, it was quick, but they kind of had the, the business definitions, almost your glossary in the data model. Um, it's nice instead of a glossary on steroids in a way that you can add those business rules. You know, I have the definition of a customer and product, but I also show the relationships between it. That is an effort in and of itself. You know, you can't go any further if you can't agree on those basic business terms. Um, and then at the logical level, that's when you can start adding attributes um, or, you know, the, the more detailed uh, keys and things like that. Um, I often, and, and all of this is controversial, we data modelers tend to be very dogmatic. <laughs> so I can see people probably rolling their eyes that some of these are going to have, a, I know we will have a very vibrant uh, conversation later at the end when we open it up to Q&A. Um, but, you know, another, you know, do we show attributes at the conceptual layer? I often do, you know, because that helps describe, I, I, I often say at the conceptual level, your goal is communication. Um, and I didn't include the examples in this deck, but I, I've used pictures. I've used a picture of a customer. Um, I've used a picture of a product in a box uh, on the data model. And if that helps communicate what it is, I'll power to it. So I often put attributes because are we talking about a customer and its first name, last name? Then I know that that's a human being customer versus is it a company and is it the VAT number and, and the company ID, you know, in my DUNS number? Then that's probably an organization, right? And, and and so even simple things like throwing a few attributes in there really helps qualify what is a customer, a product. Is this a financial product or is it a product in a box with dimensions and colors? And you know, so you can you can learn a lot by putting those attributes. But definitely up at this conceptual um, layer, the blue colors are definitely in that uh, are definitely where you really want to capture those business rules. And the difference is is that level of detail. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some examples later in this presentation. You know, I, I tend to not be dogmatic in my data models because if it works, I, I want to get the rules right. But how I show it, um, I can be a little flexible. You know, what one company might see as a conceptual may be too detailed for another company that, um, you know, w wants uh, just a higher level. So kind of, kind of your level of detail really depends on the use case as well. Um, so here's an example of a conceptual data model. Uh, this is one that uses those definitions that I, that I like, um, because you can understand what, what's an employee. Well, an employee is a full or a part-time worker on the active payroll, right? That very sentence probably could be a whole uh, conversation. Oh, I can be an employee, but not on active payroll. Maybe I'm out on maternity leave. I'm still an employee, 
or mm, we don't consider part-time employees employees in that sense of the word, or, okay, contractors aren't employees. Actually, they're in a whole different system. We, we don't even want them in this model. You know, a lot of con conversation can happen from those definitions. Um, the relationships are super important here. Super type subtypes, I use a lot of those in the data model. Again, when you roll that up or roll that down in the database or how you do that in the master data management system, it's very different, but I, I think a super type subtype is really easy to understand for most business people. An employee in this case could either be a sales rep or a support rep. We only have two types of employees in this company uh, who support customers. Um, and and people, folks, like, folks might say, well, what about finance? Shouldn't they be on there? Whatever. But it's a very easy way to understand the different types of things. We kind of learned that in kindergarten, which of these things is not like the other. Right? Um, and so that's a, a very intuitive way to look at things. Um, I like conceptual data models. And, and when we do some data modeling classes in our company, I often um, just throw up data models and, and say, what kind of company is this? And, and I find it fun because that's what I like about data modeling. It really explains a company on one page. And, and that's why business people like it because you're explaining their company in a way and getting those business rules out. Um, so if we did that with this company, this person definitely sells some sort of service or, or software or product. Um, some sort of customers have support reps um, some companies have a sales rep. So maybe the larger companies have a dedicated sales rep here. Um, you'll see, and I'm going to, I'm going to tease Andy a little bit. His uh, conceptual model did not have verb phrases on it. And I would say that that's, you always would have a verb phrase on a model because these things should read like sentences. You know, a company employs customers. That sounds funny, but maybe that's how they have it. We don't, we don't look at the, the cust, you know, the, the company as a customer It's the customer is employed by a company, right? You turn, you learn a lot. So I don't know, I can see a support rep provides support to a customer kind of self-defining. I don't know the definition between a sales rep and a company I can assume, but generally you'd have a, a verb price here. Um, this isn't a, it's really a training course. This is a webinar, um, but we have a lot of, well, I have a lot of fun. I hope the students do. We have a lot of fun um, in, in our data modeling classes of kind of turning sentences and the data models are reading data models like a sentence. And that's why these are nice because a, a business person can read these and really understand them and start to have these definitions about, about customers. They should definitely tell a story and they should make sense. Um, uh, if in, in, in the, the data modeling for the business book, we spent a lot of time on that argument of can business people understand a data model? I say, these are fighting words, absolutely. <laughs> and, if, and, if, and if they don't, then you're modeling wrong. Um, I, I found that this particular notation um, is kind of the ERI def no notation. I found this very easy to understand. It's kind of that crow's feet that most folks can sort of understand that this is one or many and this is zero or one. Um, even without explaining it, I generally do some training with business people, I don't know, 10 minutes tops on how to read these models, and then they get it. And sometimes folks will say, remind me what that zero means, or, but, but, you know, is this an uh, exclusive subtype or an inclusive, you know, folks get those concepts, you don't have to use the fancy words, um, but I've had a lot of great experience um, doing that, and in, 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 in the book, we actually did a little bit of a survey, I, I'm a strange person, but I went around a lot of my friends in, in different uh, industries, a carpenter, a music teacher, an accountant, um, and had them read models. And most folks could, even without any training, sort of understand this because it, you know, it, it makes sense. It's sort of intuitive. So um, had a lot of great experience. <clears throat> I would say use the, the language of your model because the goal, I'll say it again, the goal of a conceptual or logical or any business-centric data model is communication. So we don't want to get overly dogmatic. Um, and worry about terminology. Um, keep it simple. You know, the, I, I almost call it a PowerPoint style conceptual model. I mean, business people look at diagrams all all the time. It could be an org chart. Um, you know, they they do a lot with PowerPoint. So to me, seeing a model in a simple way is it, most business people sort of get that intuitively. Um, the other thing, and I'm sure I'll, I'll have some chat at the end. Um, these are also, I guess, fighting words. Although I think it's intuitive. Use the language of the customer. If 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 there's a difference between, I don't know, a client and a partner or, um, uh, yeah, a client and a partner or a, a client and an um, employee, don't generalize that into something like party. Maybe in the database, you know, you can have it all in one table and roll it up, but you don't want to oversimplify it. I, I actually was reviewing a conceptual model, data model of an unnamed company, and they literally had party related to thing. 
And, and to me, that was so, I have no, you would not at all know what that company was because they, they yes, could have, you could store everything at a table called party. Um, but, you know, intuitively, I mean, be a party is it's an individual or just plain old individual who has a name and an address. But we, you know, we know that, that an employee is very different than a customer, right? Or a, a, a physician is very different from a patient in terms of how that data is used and what that data is related to. And you'll find that kind of breaks down <clears throat> when you start doing uh, relationships to other entities. So I, I know from kind of an academic point of view or a cleanness point of view, it would be nice to roll everything up um, in, into a single entity or, or object. Um, but I think you're losing a lot of the valuable business rules. And I would prefer to kind of have them separated out if the business sees them separated out and have some funky relationships. And then you may have to resolve that um, in the database a certain way, but if those relationships are funky, and that's a technical word, <laughs> it's probably because the business is a little funky there and we need to understand it. And I've seen too many bad examples of, you know, bad customer service. You know, I still have a, a company I work with that I can't seem to figure out that I have a different mailing address from my physical address. I, I could draw them the data model of why, <laughs> why their system isn't working. Um, that's a very simple business rule that, you know, maybe it was simpler to do it a different way in the application and and we're living with the, the consequences. So um, please do use the, the, you will you will often find some really great uh, input by, by separating things out. Um, yeah, or put both on there and say, okay, I'm hearing the word client and I'm hearing the word customer. Um, let's draw it out. Is there a difference in the definition? Maybe you won't see the difference in the definition, but you, you start drawing relationships and you see that these have relationships to very different things and you'll sometimes flesh out the details there. So I definitely see a, a conceptual data model as a working, living document. It shouldn't be perfect when you go go to the business, you know, start with something and then the, the, you, you should be getting feedback and change it and ask a lot of questions. So use the business first uh, terminology, avoid excess detail. That's in the eye of the beholder. Um, I'll give an example of a kind of an architecture company we worked with um, that really liked that detail because they're used to a lot of detail. You know, if we're working for a retail company, they, they might really want it summed up. So, so understand your audience because you're trying to get to the nut of some issues. So the simpler, the better. Um, you know, think of anything you don't know and you want someone to explain. You want it in simple terms. You want people to get to the, the, the level of detail that you can understand. Um, sorry, moving on. Um, and, and I do think this is a great opportunity for a data architect to really have a quote seat at the table. I think a lot of business people, we work with a lot of, you know, C-level execs that have come to us because they know they need help with data and, and often have a lot of trouble communicating with IT um, and love this idea of a data model. They've had someone that can finally talk in their language, their language, not tech language, but then also understand data enough to ask those leading questions. Um, and if you love that type of thing and you like working with people and you like that sort of core logic, um, this is a great opportunity for you to kind of jumpstart your career because it's a way, you know, I'll show some quotes later in the prep, uh, the presentation. We've had so many positive experiences from data people saying, thank you. You have elegantly done this on one page that I've had trouble describing before. Um, and again, I, I, and you can argue with me, but I've had, I've had very good experience with business people understanding a data model. And you can probably tell by my voice, I'm, I'm kind of passionate and a lot of our workshops get very animated. I've had business people grab the pen out of my hand and, and start drawing their own data models and or, or coming to me later and saying, okay, I, I, I heard what you said in the workshop and I was thinking about it. I think the relationship is more like this. Is this right? Um, because again, it's a simple language. And, and if you want to be that advisor and, and really kind of get your voice heard and, and be that um, more in that that business executive uh, communication this is a great uh, place to be because um, a lot of people like the, the data modeling aspect um in this sort of simple i've been using this slide for probably too long um but i like it so i'm going to keep it and you might <laughs> wonder what is on earth is that guy on the left um but i would and i i haven't always done this perfectly myself um because we data architects and i will i will talk about myself and if you would like to apply this to you then that's fine but I don't want to offend anybody but we tend to be a kind of unique breed that we get very passionate about this um you know we we came into data for a reason we're super interested in it um and and I've, I definitely have done this let me tell you about my data model and I know we spent up all, all late last night getting the lines right and all the cardinality um, and we have to remember that not everybody is quite as excited 
about the business than, than we are. So think of the business exec in, in the middle. They're super busy. Everyone, everyone's busy, but you know, they definitely think they're busy. They're, they're, they're very results oriented. They, they probably have their, you know, their quota to make or their deadlines to make. And, and just like anyone, it's sort of the, you know, what's in it for me. And so this, this data person is going to come to me and draw boxes and lines on the wall. Why, why should I care? So what you don't want to do is just sort of get very academic and tell this person, you know, the world's going to end if your data model is not in third normal form. And I picture that guy with the, you know, walking down the street with a billboard on himself saying, you know, the world's ending tomorrow because things aren't in third normal form. And and the business person is going to say, what on earth is third normal form and why should I care? And that's the right answer. You should not use words like third normal form. You could say, we need our data to be consistent or we don't want, you know, we want to remove redundancy or, or things like that. They might understand or care. You know, we're trying to get a single view of customer might be a better way to go than say we need third normal form. <laughs> um, but we tend to do that. And sometimes it slips in. But again, use that language of the business. So, you know, the difference if, if you're the data advisor, you kind of say, you know, anyone on my team has heard me say this, what's the so what? So we can do the model, it might be accurate, but what's the story? Why would a business person care about this? So you could say it could be those relationships. Wow, if we could link our customer data with the product, we could increase sales. Now they care because it's going to be something. Or, you know, I like to think on the, the positive, the other thing where I'm, I'm sort of judging us in IT it's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing in the right co uh, the context of we're sort of paid to find problems and fix problems, right? Um, that can often be seen as very negative in the business. And I know I've done this myself. You do a presentation and you say, here's all the things that are wrong with your data and we're going to come fix them. That's fine. And we have the right intention. But what, what sort of coming in from the business is you just told me I'm messed up, right? And they may know that. And you often get a lot of buy-in by finding these problems and saying, you know, you got, you folks have had trouble linking your customer data with your product data. We found out why, and we can get these roles fixed. We're going to help you. That can be very good. Um, but often we kind of overdo that. And we might want to say, look at the opportunity we could have if we did this, right? And it's just a flip of the words, um, but we we can, we tend to do that a bit. So again, these data models can and, and should be super popular with the business because you're speaking in their language. You're showing them the so what in terms of we're trying to get these business rules so we can get a marketing campaign out or we can you know make your um, customer data more accurate or you're not going to get fined or you know et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can understand your student and, and student grades linking to attrition rates or something, right? So but you need to kind of put it in their language so that they can understand the why. And I think we often forget that when we're in the correctly in the weeds trying to understand a database. So I'm not knocking the idea that we need to understand a database. And I've done this to myself too, too of you and I've been up all night the night before trying to figure out the database. And then you have to explain to the business, you kind of have to stop and take that free breath and say, who's my audience? I want to simplify. I want to kind of talk about the so what. Um, so yeah, tell a story. And yes, here's another data model <laughs> cartoon. Um, but we do, I, I heard uh, on the radio a couple of years ago that stuck with me that, you know, humans are storytellers. Think of our ancestors around the, the campfire, right? The, all our history used to be verbal, right? Before we wrote everything down. Uh, but someone kind of summarized it in, you know, we can't even sleep without having dreams, which are stories. You know, we're such storytellers. Even when we're asleep, we're telling ourselves stories. And that one kind of stuck with me because it's it's the message. It's the messaging. Um, I was in marketing for a while at one point, and that was probably the most helpful part of my career because it really helped you distill the message to people. No one cares. You know, I tell myself this all the time. No one cares about your data model. I do. Um, but they care about the results of the data model. And they understand, they care about how that impacts their business. So you will get people interested in the data model, um, but not for the reasons perhaps you're interested in. No one cares that you spent all night, you know, getting those lines right. And I know, I, I feel you, all the people out there who do that, um, but they definitely will be engaged in your model and they will care um, because, you know, the customer here we have in this data model, a customer can buy uh, um, more than one product, but a product can be bought by more than one customer. And they might say, no, we only have one customer on an order, you know, right? And they'll, they'll start to get um, very engaged when, when you get those business rules right. Um, or you could put your children to sleep reading them day tomorrow <laughs> in the evening. Um, so uh, again, these are very popular with the business. Um, a lot of, again, business people start to use them themselves to kind of communicate with IT. These are some very um, actual quotes from some of our, our customers. And you not to 
pat ourselves on the back, but I think it was more about, yes, this can be popular and the different types of people saying this. Um, so one on the upper left was a basically a kindergarten teacher um, and, and she was there whiteboarding with us, um, defining what a classroom was, a virtual classroom, the same as a physical classroom. And that was their whole discussion. And there's a lot of nuance to that. You know, what does it mean with online learning? Is that still a quote? classroom if the curriculum is the same but you don't have it in a physical building right there's a lot of conversation around that right now um and her, her comment was this is really really elegant you just summed up our organization in a single page um she directly said that so i stole it from her mouth um, but we hear that same type of thing a lot thank you I, i've been trying i knew we had this problem and i could never explain why and some of those rules were wrong um uh, over on the right, uh, the VP of software development, that was almost from the opposite perspective. This was a VP of software development and was writing applications. Um, and we did some uh, workshopping with kind of some, some customer journey mapping and some data models kind of overlaid on that and, and understood where, what data was used where in the customer journey. And his quote was, this was so helpful because I'd never seen the data from the customer's perspective before. Um, and he said, this will really help me with my app development. Thank you very much. And he, he was uh, surprisingly one of the, the biggest proponents of this kind of conceptual business-led modeling at the end of the workshop, because again, he might've seen the table called customer. He didn't know all the nuance behind it and he needed to know that for developing his, his software application. So it's not only a business model, it's and, it's business and tech. Um, one of the low ref, this chief marketing officer, you know, her quote was, I, I don't know what this data model stuff is, but you're the first one to explain to me why my campaigns aren't working. Um, and to them, it was a relationship between some of the data. Um, the, my favorite one was over on the right. Um, we did a, this a big utility company on the East Coast of the U.S. Um, and we had been there. I think it was about a week, maybe two. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I was doing the, the, the readout and explaining all of this, you know, the relationships between pipes. And, and I can't even remember now, but it made a whole lot of sense. And this person said, wow, how long have you been with the company? You know, clearly you must have been here about 20 years. And I said, one week. And it doesn't mean that I'm particularly smart. It's the data modeling uh, methodology of I just asked a bunch of leading questions. People told me their business. I put it in a, a, a model and we read it back to them in sentences. Um, and it was just because we had talked to a lot of different people in the org and everyone sees their slice. They had never, that's another big benefit, had never seen all of the slices put together. So um, yeah, that was kind of the, the power of data modeling. You know, I thought you'd been here 20 years and we had only been there a little over a week. Um, and then, you know, we have more people asking for these data models and and that happens a lot too. You know, we work with whether one department or, or one org and, and a lot of folks want to have those same benefits. So um, one do want to get down to that logical uh, level, and I am conscious of time because I, I see some chats and Q&As in there. Um, the here is where you want to get into the little more business rules, and, and data modelers are probably arguing about this model already, and you should be, right? It, some of it is, is getting the... Um, you know, the, the attributes, you know, do we have a customer identifier as the identifier or do we need more of a natural key? Do we go by first name, middle name, last name? Is last name the right term? Does every culture use their last name as the family name? Should it be family name? Should it be, you know, uh, what is the gender? You know, all of these different um, things need to be argued out or, or fleshed out. Uh, you'll see this one does have verb places. So, you know, a customer can place zero more one order. I might have a problem with that. Is that person a customer if they haven't placed an order? Yeah, that, that that's actually a very, there's no one answer to that, right? So uh, a question I often get is, sh should I just use an industry model? Um, why, why should I go through this effort of building my own model? And I say, well, if you just kind of are, are a you know, cookie cutter business and you do nothing unique, and yeah, I would think you're probably not in business if you're just cookie cutter and have nothing unique about your company. Um, so yeah, you might start with the industry model. They're a great kind of jump start, but it's often something as simple as that that'll cause an application you've bought not to work of, you know, you might say, I, I include all of my pre-sales customers and my customers all to us or customers. We treat them the same. They get the same emails and, and all that sort of thing. And I can't put the customer in the system until they've bought something might be a problem with this data model. And again, often it's a problem the business is having that goes down to a circle <laughs> on a line or a, a cardinality, one or more. Is it one thing or is it more than one thing? And so it is helpful to go through these, either to understand what you have already or to kind of flesh out those, those business rules. Um, one of my favorite stories was one of our nonprofit clients. Uh, a lot of 
young folk uh, the, that kind of were in the nonprofit industry and stereotypes are abound in, in the world. And they were doing some um, negotiations with a vendor and the vendor was sort of saying, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. And they said, well, here's our logical data model. We'd like you to match that. <laughs> and the vendor, vendor was flabbergasted, uh, but the vendor made some changes um, to accommodate them as part of the onboarding that would not have happened had they not had their act together. Um, so surprised the vendor didn't expect that from a bunch of 20 year olds in a, in a nonprofit, um, but they had their act together and they were able to make those decisions before they bought the product and get that customized rather than finding it two years later when we had already implemented a lot of these things that would have cost a lot more to fix it later. Um, so here you are a little bit more getting towards um, a, a data structure. Um, I'm going to tease Tim this time a little bit from the beginning when he called things like acid transactions legacy. I don't think they're legacy. I think they're foundational. I, I do want my my bank to have acid transactions from when I, you know, deposit money or I, I buy a stock transaction. Um, so, yes, they are still absolutely a lot of the rules you are getting in this type of model because you do want kind of those core you know this is often a first step to something like master data management where i am trying to get that single unduplicated clear view of what is the customer not all data analysis leads to this i might be doing more exploratory graph patterns and trying to see relationships but none of those work if i don't know what a customer is i can't if i want to see the patterns of customer and i don't know what a customer is it's a lot harder or i have the data wrong or, or data quality so these types of rules um really be helpful um even even what data is important so one of the things here on the left speaking of data quality we had worked with a, a customer that had done a lot of data profiling um had outsourced some of that and, and some of the results came back that their their fax number was empty 90 percent of the time and someone's like what's a fax number <laughs> that that might not have been the key data elements i should have been focusing on so this process of starting to put the attributes on a logical data model can help you focus of what do we need to worry about fax number um, probably isn't one anymore, but maybe cell phone number should be, right? Or, and have had some very healthy discussions with marketing teams of, of now for a customer, what are those key data elements or key attributes that I need to track around a customer and maybe what isn't so important? So again, I talked for a long time, but one tends to, uh, a model like this could could be a, you know, a two-hour workshop with the business users really getting a lot of great information about their business and, and something like this. Um, one other thing here, and I, I kind of touched on it, but if you're like me, you probably want things right. And, and a lot of us in tech, you know, get nervous. I, I don't want to put this up here because it might be wrong. I've totally gone the other way now. I just put it up there and knowing it's probably wrong and someone will tell me. And that really generates a lot of conversation um, in the business. And, and that can be really helpful. Um, a couple of success stories here, and, and I won't talk a lot about them because each one of these has a full webinar behind it that we did with Data Diversity. Um, this one is one of my more fun ones because uh, it dealt with fish and cows, uh, which was fun with the Environment Agency of England. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is we often talk about the business as if that's a thing. Right? And, and I just think that's, you know, it's, it's IT, it's us and the rest of the world. And they're all quote, the business and the business here, we're, we're scientists and our sponsor was you know a, a clinically trained scientist super smart super technical we often say oh the business isn't technical well she was certainly technical she knew more about science than i ever would um but what we did was talk to those different science scientists and try to get some core terminology you know what is a, a living organism is a <laughs> i had a lot of fun with this one is the fish the same as the cow the same as bacteria in the water actually it sort of was you were taking samples right and so we had a lot of workshops with these folks learned a lot and that was their biggest takeaway is we as an organization helped ourselves work together more efficiently and share data more efficiently it also helped kick off their data governance because we realized that we were sharing data and if we don't have those core definitions about some of the scientific terms we're using we can't share data we can't publish findings on the web to the world to do more research around the environment so this was a great success story about something that's a little different that you might not think about another success story that was a couple years old uh, that we did last year I mean, maybe on the call i didn't check names they often join us here on the calls um is is kiwit and i love this example partly because uh, we always in art and data architecture use the example of it's just like if you were building a building it's just like a regular architecture and these are architects literally they are building some of the major infrastructure in the country and building the big buildings 
Um, so they really love data models. And, and again, are you going to tell these guys that are building you know, nuclear power plants that they're not technical? <laughs> they were super technical. So these guys and gals you know, built super technical models. So they're, and I won't bore you too much, you can watch that webinar, their conceptual data models actually started to kind of lean more towards that logical, maybe even physical, technical, because they, they like to see a lot of detail. I wouldn't have showed my data models of that technical nature to maybe an investment bank, because they probably wanted it a little higher level. Um, but they they got models in a second, because they live and breathe models. They see diagrams. They see architecture diagrams all the time. So they were a different fun client, where again, we often say, well, the business is not technical. Gosh, <laughs> you know, to tell someone again, build, building a major infrastructure or someone doing advanced scientific studies, they're technical just in a different way. So they often really get models. Or I use finance as an example of not being technical. That's not true either, right? They know they do numbers, they know, you know, algorithms, and they often get this really quickly as well. So I do want to just touch on this quickly. I, I also do want to get the questions, but um, we use this analogy and it fits nicely with this keyword example of that a difference between designing and building. And we get that intuitively. If, if there's some background notes, I have some folks building a deck <laughs> behind me and we designed it, right? We know how long the structure was and it was on a picture and a piece of paper. There's no way I can I can confuse what we did uh, on the, we actually used CAD models to draw it out with the guys digging dirt in my backyard today. But in IT, it's a little easier to mix those two up, two, two, two up right? That, that, when are we showing a physical data model or a database structure versus what I show the business? And but I had you thinking of that example in my head. Don't show uh, a, one of those models that um, Andy showed before with all the data types and foreign keys and all that to the business. Just like you wouldn't make the homeowner dig in the dirt when they're you know the homeowner designs with you. And I say I want to have these, these buildings, the rooms this way. The homeowner doesn't swing the hammer generally unless they ask, right? So um, that's maybe sometimes an easier way to, to kind of understand the difference. Don't mix them up. <laughs> um, but they're super important. And I don't want to belittle that uh, because the beauty of putting a data model like this um, in a proper data modeling tool is that IT can consume it and show it in their language and, and so uh, skip a lot of steps and then generate things like DDL or technical code. Also, you can whiteboard it. I've done it with sticky notes. We've done it with pictures, right? Absolutely. If that's what gets those business rules out, I will, you know, do interpretive dance or whatever that gets the point across. But generally, at some point, if you're the architect, putting it in a proper tool, you know, even some, you know, there's drawing tools out there, and I won't, won't name them. You know which ones they are. They can draw a picture, but it is also nice to have a true modeling tool with metadata that you can generate, either reverse or forward engineer. Um, back because I, I definitely talked about the top down approach Andy and his had kind of talked about the bottom up and and generally it's a middle out right you often you know have what the business said and then look at the database and that can be some of those aha moments well you said a customer could only have one order or one account um, but we have 16 customers with multiple accounts and that's what the database structure says so which one's right I mean, that that can be helpful uh, but I would generally start when you're talking to the business with that top down this is what a physical data model looks like. We already showed one earlier, but you know they are sort of well suited for things like relational database structures because there is a point to that. Getting a lot of those business rules is a great use case for relational models. Isn't the only way though. I wouldn't say don't do a conceptual data model if you don't have a relational database, although most folks do, because you're still getting those key terms. That some of it might go in a business glossary. Some of it may be in your application development code, um, but you're still getting those core business rules. Um, a couple, I, I won't go into depth here. We already talked a, a few, but no matter what industry you're in, you can use a data model. And we've had, again, the, the, the method is the same. The results are really different from, I talked about the environment agency, early childhood, e-commerce, universities, construction, agile software development companies have still used data models, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it doesn't matter the industry, it's, it's the methodology. So um, use data models. It does make you more efficient because you get to those core things that might have taken you two years to fix up early. <laughs> um, speak the language of the business in the data model, and that's going to make you more of a data advisor and less data architect. To put on a different hat when you're talking to the business, um, but it does help with the physical implementations. We will talk in a totally different note on graph databases next month if you can join us. Um, 
sales pitch. We do this for a living if you need help and we are hiring. So if you at any of the point in time say, hey, these are our people, she's talking my language, give us a look up on LinkedIn, we're hiring. And I will pass it over now to Shannon to open it up to questions. Hey, Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, I'm going to try and get to as many questions as possible. Um, would you mind sharing insights on alternative data modeling, such as data modeling of social media, website, emails, and satellite images? Um. Yeah, well, the one we're talking about, um, social media, depends what you're looking I mean, there are, I mean, what they might be talking about is there's different physical database storage, right? So for, say, a website and usage, I might use something like a key value pair, right? It's still probably helpful at the business level, though, again, at that conceptual model level. A lot of those tools kind of grew up in ER land, but it doesn't matter to say, what are we trying to get from this data structure? I'm trying to say, um, a, a customer has a web interaction or has a social media post. We actually are working with one of the big social media companies right now doing data modeling. And just that, what is, what is the what is the link between a user and all those types of interactions? Is it just a web click? Is it a post? Is it a, you know, there's a lot around that. So again, separating out I still think just these high level business rules can be helpful, but there's other, you know, if you're doing application development, sometimes a UML model is a little better suited because that's kind of meant for application development. But again, um, I, I would think when, when you're at that business level, you're trying to get understand the business and the business rules. So maybe let's think less about implementation and more about use case, but, but there are, you know, again, UML might be good for app dev and, and there are some other ways to, you know, or just sticky note it. Right? What are we trying to get from this web application or what are we trying to track? And that might help you decide what data modeling usage you're using um, for both. You know, social media company, when they're trying to see how many users are, are paying their contracts, might use a relational database. If I'm trying to see who's related to whom, it might be a graph model, right? But they still need to understand their business at a certain high level business model. All right, I'll be quiet so you can ask another question, Shannon. Or oh, I'm sorry, right. did, did Tim or Andy want to chime in on that? Just going to invite yeah, Andy or Tim if you have anything additional. Well, I, I just chime in in terms of social media. LinkedIn is a customer and they use this for many different use cases, right? But, um, you know, around user profiles, is one of the most common ones. Uh, but that said, obviously, they, they're a huge organization, a huge business. They have many, many applications, many, many use cases, and they'll use, you know, the right, uh, the database that suits their needs. And, and they're doing data modeling and business modeling you know, first before they're putting data in the database and building those applications, right? So it depends on your business goals. It depends what you're trying to build, right? Perfect. So what about um, public service data insurance employment, for example? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite hear. What about public service data insurance employment, for example? Um, I'm not sure the question. Mean, I would say anything could could be uh, modeled. Um, so we we are working with one kind of insurance company that that summarizes public data uh, and, and public some of it's public and some of it's internal, and they use a data model. Whether you know sometimes they can um, own it and sometimes they don't. But um, yeah, I would think anything could be modeled. But I, I am honest. Also, maybe I didn't understand the question. So didn't know if Tim or Andy, if you have any other input there. I think you said it well. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to slip in at least one more question here. Um, can, how do you handle past, present, and future tense in relationship? Past, present, and future tense. Well, uh, yeah, I, I I think I see where the person's going. It, it's it's the business. So, so you're you're not trying to model history unless that's a star scheme then that would be a date right i i i, I want to know transactions over time you would link it to the date but these are more kind of present tense business rules can a customer have more than one account at the present time it, it's not ha have over time with history are, are we looking you know so that might be um you know maybe separating out of are we thinking dimensional in terms of reporting or business rules in terms of applications. Um, and there's also, you know, kind of defining the, the, 
the context of your model. It could be, is this as is or to be is another one I often ask. Are we describing what it is now or what we want it to be? And often you have both, you know, or are we trying to talk about trends over time or kind of a more of a transactional application? It's kind of kind of good to set your intention on that, if that makes sense. But open to Tim and Andy's thoughts there too. Yeah, my, my one thing on that, or my one point is um, data models. If you're going to be talking about present state, future state, um, I think that lends itself more towards an enterprise architecture model, um, but the data models can be incorporated in that. So this way you can do your slice, you know, your points in time. And to your point, you know, a date in a dimensional model is is very different than what it's going to look like in the future. So I, I've I've I gravitate towards um, enterprise architecture if if you want that future state. And I, and I would agree with that because I think a uh, because a, a data model is a good part of it in a bridge architecture at the business level. It's kind of where that's fitting, you know, when you're thinking ahead. So I, I wouldn't disagree. But Tim, any thoughts there? Uh, no, nothing really to add there in terms of, you know, future state and versus present state now. All right. And there's so many great questions. There's one here, Donna, about if your book's the best, um, but maybe I can get that those details place to learn how to do this. Um, Maybe I can get that from you to send in the follow-up email. Because again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to recording and the additional details requested. Thank you all so much. Thank you again to Couchbase and to Urban by Quest for helping to for sponsoring and helping make these webinars happen. Appreciate it as always. You guys have been great. Thanks for our attendees. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks all. Thank you.